What I'm going to do is um, uh, give you an overview of what BitMessage is, some of its social implications, um, if it has any social implications, because it's still quite young. Uh, and also we're going to look a little bit about where it's being used and, uh, and what it is. So first of all, um, how many of you have already looked at the white paper? <laughs> Nobody. Well, that's very good. Because otherwise, you'd be in for a little bit of a boring part in the beginning. And uh, some of the things that I'm going to present here also come from the white paper. Uh, later on, uh, there is going to be some new information that's not in the white paper that um, shows BitMessage in the wild. But first we're going to ask ourselves, what is BitMessage? Well, it's a communications method. It's like email, but not quite like email. So you could say BitMessage is supposed to be as ubiquitous as email, i.e. they want it to be widely used, but um, uh, email has security implications. Um, I believe also because of the cryptography it uses, uh, but also because email was in the first instance never designed to be uh, transported over um, encrypted uh, communications channels. It was first just designed as a a way to communicate and to do that very directly but also to do that while a computer on the one end is for example not operating and storing the mail somewhere on the server and then relaying it across to the other side. Uh, BitMessage um, looks to do the same thing but in a very different way. What we have with BitMessage is that it's completely peer-to-peer -peer. so it bootstraps itself and uh, from uh, from uh, that bootstrapping, it finds its peers and sends the messages directly or relays them across other peers to other peers. So it's used as, uh, as a way to send encrypted messages completely uh, without central servers. It's also decentralized because of that and um, the uh, programmer called it, calls it trustless. And what does he mean by trustless? Well, you don't necessarily have to know the other person or exchange a key with him by doing an action as a user. So all this happens automatically. BitMessage uh, as a client does that for you. Um, it's trustless in the same way as Bitcoin is also trustless because much of this code is based on Bitcoin's code. Uh, it uses strong authentication. Well, perhaps if you know a bit more about cryptography, you might ask yourself, well, what is strong? But it does use uh, a long set of characters as a, an address to be able to authenticate and that address is at the same time a hash for a uh, public key and uh, it hides uh, non-content data from passive eavesdro eavesdroppers so that means when you send a message to someone else an eavesdropper cannot use the metadata of your message passing to find out from where it came and to where it goes Well, why use BitMessage? I mean, if we have email anyways, and we can use PGP, and there's a lot of tools, and you know, also not very savvy users could use CryptoCats if they really want to you know, pass a secret message along. There's so many ways to communicate. You could even use RetroShare. So why use BitMessage? Um, well, it takes a lot of the work out of the hands of the end user. So it enables anonymous communication, and um, it makes sure that you cannot be easily wiretapped, at least you have, of course, the security problems on the endpoints, <coughs> but in the network itself, things seem to be quite well arranged. We'll look a little bit into that later. Um, there's also the possibility for un unauthenticated escrow, so you could um, do a lot of things with bit, bit message that uh, can also be done with email, but then um, to do that without necessarily needing to have two trusted parties on each end. So you could use it for um, not just messaging, you could use it for, for trading, you could use it for uh, sending different types of protocol over the BitMessage networks. Um, and also, of course, BitMessage can be used as a mass messaging tool. And that is because essentially BitMessage uses mass messaging as one of the main components of getting the message across. Well, how does it work? Um, the, the guttural internals, uh, the Python code itself is not something I'm going to dig through. 
But um, to, to get a little bit of an understanding of what big message does, we can at least look at when we use it, what it does. And one of the things it does is when you start a program, it bootstraps. So it takes uh, a small list of IPs and peers and it connects to those IPs to find out how can I make sure that I get strapped into the network. This is the same thing that Bitcoin does and uh, it's quite common at the moment in peer-to-peer -peer <coughs> programs to do this. So um, this list uh, in BitMessage can also be changed and passed around so that there is a big chance that when you start BitMessage there's always a peer that will be um, online to connect to. And from that peer you can bootstrap into the, into the rest of the network. Now this bootstrapping is very important because BitMessage relies on the fact that messages are continually passed around and that, can, that they can be broadcast to a great number of peers at the same time. If this is not the case, your message is not going to come across or the chance that it does is greatly diminished. Um, well, to authenticate, BitMessage uses addresses. So you don't necessarily have to tell someone else who you are, but you have to use some form of identification to at least be able to receive messages. And you do that by having a BitMessage address. Now, what, what the, the program of BitMessage has done is just prepend it with a BM dash, and then after that is a long hash, which is um, basically the hash of the public key of um, your uh, BitMessage client. So uh, you can actually utilize more, more than one public key, and the support for that is going to be expanded. But to keep it simple for now, let's say you want to send a message across, you have, as is usual in public and private key cryptography, you have a private key, and you encrypt your message with that private key. That is a key that only remains on your own computer. Then the message is encrypted, and it can be sent out into the network. But the recipient of the message cannot decrypt the message if it doesn't have a public key. So at the same time, your public key is also sent out into the network. And the recipient can find out which public key to use by using this hash and um, uh, comparing the private key to the correct hash and then trying to decipher the message that is passing through. So where is your message when you've sent it? Well, the funny thing with BitMessage is that it could be everywhere or anywhere. Because just like with Bitcoin, the messages are passed to as many people as possible. So if you send a hello world message to Bob or Alice, then the hello world message will be passed to many great number of bit, uh, bit message clients in the whole network. Now, this um, <coughs> is positive on the one hand because the message arrives quicker and it's also uh, the chance that it arrives on the other end is much greater. But it could also cause a lot of congestion and to, um, to make sure that that congestion doesn't grow out of its bounds and the scalability is protected. Um, BitMessage also works with a number of streams and these streams make sure that, uh, that your BitMessage does not go over the entire network. That was the first idea of BitMessage but uh, since then it has been changed a little bit because it caused a lot of congestion in the network. So these streams are also encoded in the hash at the beginning and there's a number which signifies which stream the message gets put into at that time. And that stream is passed around to a lot of recipients, but not necessarily everybody. Uh, so messages are spread around by just forwarding them, just, just keep on sending them, sending them until they either time out or until they've found their um, target or the target has found the message. And when the target has found the message, it sends a message back into the network that, that says, yes, I received it. Um, to make sure that this, this is protected, that the network doesn't get overloaded with messages, there's a, a spam protection mechanism built in. And the programmer has used the idea of proof of work. And what uh, the computer that sends a message has to do is it has to calculate for a long time to generate this proof of work before the message is allowed to be sent into the network. This is exactly the same proof of work mechanism as used in Bitcoin. So there's not much difference there. 
but in this case it's not used to generate a Bitcoin, but in this case it's used to, to prove that uh, the message being sent is sent by a normal bit message client and not by some spamming node. Now in theory, of course, you could say, well, that's great, but what if you use a lot of big computers and do some really no big number crunching? You could still send a lot of messages into the network. And that's true. So let's say if you're the NSA and you say, well, we have a few million dollars, we want to you know, co congest the, the, the bit message network. Yes, you could uh, rent a whole bunch of VPSs, do a lot of number crunching, and then try and spam uh, uh, network addresses. In practice, however, this has not been done yet, as far as we know. And uh, of course, there are a lot of hackers and interested people measuring the traffic in this network to find out if everything is still healthy. So, could happen in the future, but until that time, it seems that proof of work is good enough to make sure that, uh, that the spam is limited. But uh, does that mean that uh, if I successfully decrypted my the message which was meant for me, uh, at that moment it stops spreading? Uh, at that moment, your client sends a message back into the network that the message no, the, the network understands then that that means it should stop uh, spreading that uh, encrypted message. Either that, yeah. or the message drops out of yeah. the cache. <coughs> it drops out of the cache after 48 hours. So, okay. So, okay. Um, there are uh, SHA hashes and RIPMD hashes used for uh, the addressing. Um, also, uh, the right recipient, as you just mentioned, has the right key, and that's how he knows the message is for him. For the rest, or for her, for the rest, the messages are all over the network at as much time as possible. But to make sure that you don't grow a huge cache on your hard drive or wherever you store your cache, like Bitcoin, uh, the programmer of BitMessage decided to give a timeout, a default timeout to a message in the cache. And that is approximately 48 hours. So if a message isn't delivered within that time, it's dropped. And this is necessary because otherwise, if, if the messages are all over the place, all the time, these caches could grow, could grow very, very large indeed. And as we can see with Bitcoin, uh, the blockchain, as they call that cache, is already very, very large. Several gigabytes, I'm counting. And with every transaction, this blockchain just grows and grows and grows. Now, in Bitcoin, they've thought of something uh, by, for example, creating another client called Electrum that only downloads a part of that blockchain to mitigate this problem. And so you see they still fall back a little bit to needing some central servers or bigger nodes and clients that do store the entire blockchain for everyone else. Apparently, it's very difficult to do everything totally distributed and entirely decentralized. Um, well, finally, there's also the broadcasting option of BitMessage, and it's more or less second nature, or should we rather say first nature, to BitMessage. So what you can do is not just send a message to another person, you can also say, well, if you, um, br uh, if you take my address and you subscribe to it, you can receive my messages. So you could broadcast in a, in a ma mass messaging mode to a great number of people. So it's like Twitter in that uh, sense. Yes, indeed. And so, um, uh, but in, it looks like an option, but actually uh, it's built into the, mess uh, into the bit messaging client itself. And so it was a very logical uh, option to add. Um, some examples of bit message in the wild. Uh, there's uh, a lot of fans of uh, cryptography at the moment, and it's growing. And not that they know a lot about it, but people feel encroached, uh, especially because of the news lately. Um, and they start thinking. And when they start thinking, interesting things happen. And one of these things is that they, they draw to cryptography tools. And um, so there's a lot of bit message and Bitcoin fanboys out there. Um, and they, they set up websites, they set up blogs, they tell each other about it, and thus the, the message gets spread. Okay. May I ask how many people here have ever downloaded Bitcoin, the client? That's a good idea, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. And BitMessage, who's used that? 
<laughs> I have to. I, I must say it's still a bit unwieldy at the moment. Uh, if you look at it, for me it's not very difficult. I can program myself and digging into that is not very hard. But for, uh, for let's say, end users that know not, not, don't know much about computers or already think it's quite difficult to send an email, uh, bit message is still a bit daunting. So the interface is not very friendly and let's say there's a lot of the improvement that can be done there. Um, and this, this improvement, people are working on it. So for example, we have um, uh, a group working on a bit message online web application. Now personally for me, that more or less defeats the purpose of bit message because you do have to trust that party that hosts this solution to uh, treat your data kindly, as we could say. Um, so for some it might be a, a nice solution to feel secure, but if you really want to be secure, uh, it would be best to run the bit message client on your own computer and then rather on a, for example, free and open source system than a closed source system. Yes? Uh, doesn't it work like uh, blockchain.info? Uh, uh, it's a, it's a, a web Bitcoin wallet, uh, but the, uh, the calculation happens in your browser through JavaScript. Yes. So it's, it's fairly secure. Well, in this case, BitMessage online web application called bitmessage.me doesn't do that, but uh, Frog does, and that's the new project that's been supported by a lot of Bitcoin uh, um, donators. And uh, he's creating a free and open source bit message client for the web that you can host yourself. So it could uh, give rise to a lot of services for social communities and local communities. And that, uh, that, that could be a bit more secure already uh, than a, a big service like bitmessage.me that wants to serve everyone in the whole world. Um, so Frog is, uh, is still very, very early stages. It's even questionable if the project will take off. It has been funded, but, well, it's happening in, the, uh, um, in, in a development sphere that's not very official. So just have to wait and see what, what comes out of that. Um, there are, of course, also bit message to email gateways. And there's two of them that I know, bitmessage.ch and bitmessage.cc and they, um, they make it possible to set up an account again uh, so you do have to trust those parties uh, and you can send bit messages to either bit message recipients or uh, people that just use normal email and they try and make it as easy as possible to interchange between those two. I think that's a very interesting project because it could attract people to, um, to use bit message even though at the moment it isn't very attractive per se to use it unless you're very security conscious. Um, and then there's also a pseudo Twitter, as you could say, or a Twitter replacement uh, called BitChirp. They have a very nice, inspiring logo. <laughs> and uh, they, uh, they are basically a simple website with a bit message address. And what you send to that address with hashtags gets put on that website as if it's a Twitter um, front page. I also read that there are now people trying to uh, see if they can somehow build a social network like you know, Facebook or whatever uh, in a uh, bit message like way. But it's not very, I mean, it's not very clear if it's just someone shouting something or... True. Well, with many solutions I also see um, there's a lot of uh, uh, great innovation going on. Mm -hmm. But bringing that in innovation to, uh, to, as you could say, normal people mm -hmm. that are actually going to use it, that's a whole other step. And I don't see that happening very quickly yet. Mm -hmm. It's happening slowly, but it needs a lot of work. Uh, personally, I'm one of those people that would like to see that happen. I, I also uh, uh, run a small community of people, and they uh, communicate using cryptography as much as possible. Um, and I often get questions that seem very simple to me, but are very uh, real to the to the end user that like, you know I can't use the bit message client because this or this or that. One of the issues already being that it uses uh, uh, the latest Python tools, and some people don't even know where to get those or how to unpack those on their computer. So if it's not a ready-made package, uh, there's a great chance that many people are not going to use it, including Linux users, because there's also Linux users that don't know much about technology. 
Uh, yes. Um, how do you get the public keys? Because that's the big problem with PGP, that you have to have key signing parties and stuff like that. But how do I get a public key if I've never met the person? Good question. Well, uh, the BitMessage client takes care of that. So when, uh, when I send a message to you, um, you receive that. Uh, you receive all messages, and your your BitMessage client uh, handles all the messages you receive in that stream. Um, when it receives, when you receive my message, uh, it will use the hash uh, attached to that message, the SHA-512, to find out uh, where to get the public key. And the public key also comes from uh, from my client in this case, and it gets sent through the network. And uh, that's the way you get the uh, the uh, public key. I'm sorry, I was mixing up private and public. No, that's the way you get the public key. And then your bit message client basically just tries to decode the message with different public keys. So um, to me, that doesn't sound very efficient. But then again, um, uh, bit message is still in development. So there may be more efficient ways of doing that in the future because trying to decode every message is still uh, takes time. I also answer the question. Uh, the, the point with bit match, match, with PGP you have the and the CA uh, certificates. You have to know whether the person, whether Joachim really belongs to the the uh, hash address. Uh, with bit message you don't know. You only know for sure that the guy or girl with that hash address did receive your message. But but it remains a guess if that address belongs to your friend or girlfriend or whoever. True. There's still a case. Yeah. There's still a possible case of impersonation. At the same time, though, you cannot use two addresses at the same time. So, uh, if I claim a certain address and we met in person, and you know 100% sure that that message does belong to me, then uh, the chances almost infinitely great that that message does come from me. Um, but if you want to look deeper into the cryptographic aspects of that, well. You'd have to talk to the cryptographic expert here, and also um, uh, read into the code uh, of BitMessage itself. Um, I also did a small, simple SWOT analysis of BitMessage. Of the things I see are possibilities uh, and also threats, etc., etc. Um, what I think are some strengths of BitMessage is, for example, the proof of work. It's very good that, uh, that it's more difficult to spam in bit message than it is, for example, in email. Um, it solves a lot of problems, for example, not having to run a big server with spam assassin, clam AV, and you name it. Um, uh, and I know that that is a lot of work because I run a mail server myself. And so sometimes you wish that that was all not necessary. Um, there's uh, Besides strengths, uh, there's opportunities. For example, the um, white paper also mentions that BitMessage in the future will be paired with BitTorrent. And then BitMessage will uh, be able to provide, for example, uh, a message aspect or metadata about a torrent and link straight to the torrent. So for, uh, for big attachments that are, for example, non-crucial or they could also be encrypted, BitTorrent could be utilized. Um, at the same time, uh, with the development of the BitTorrent Sync client at the moment, which is still closed source, sadly, um, but uh, the, the the possibilities uh, grow there. So uh, that is definitely an opportunity for BitMessage because right now attachments cannot be sent and received with BitMessage unless they are encoded in Base64 or some other. Unicode, either supportable text <coughs> message, and uh, they have to fit in the content of the bit message, which is reasonably small. Mm -hmm. I don't know exactly how small, but it won't be beyond a few KB. Um, the possibilities of bit message do rival email. Um, it, it's true that after 48 hours, a message is dropped from the cache, but a client will retry to send it if um, if it has not been received on the other end. So um, there may still need to be some tweaking uh, done on the cache system of BitMessage uh, and how long messages are retained or not. Um, but this is definitely uh, um, useful and also I think with some development from a user end user perspective. And so it does have the, uh, the possibility to 
well, partially replace email or at least work alongside it. Um, Can you add an attachment to a bit message? Uh, a no, at the moment you cannot do that. Oh, unless so you, you encode it in Day64, text. but that's not usable for most people. Oh, okay. They don't know how to do that. <coughs> so, um, so it's it not really built for attachments, it's built for short, or let's say... Yeah, it has to be text message. Yes. Okay. Um, do you do you know any numbers about? I, I mean, uh, what are machine requirements to to get uh, the proof of work? Uh, well, um, in the white paper it says an average machine yeah. <laughs> takes about uh, four minutes to to calculate the proof of work. Now I don't know uh, so there's exactly. There's there's no timeout on the proof of work. So an African with average, average machine, machine in 2012. So, um, yeah, so four minutes per month. For example, it, it might not be uh, useful for, uh, let's say, a Raspberry Pi. I think a Raspberry Pi uh, would take a great deal longer to send a message. I've tried to send messages from, uh, for example, an EPC and a thin client, yeah. a very old thin client, and that took well over an hour. So, um, so yes, the average PC is not everyone's average PC. So you might, you might uh, say that it's not a very green solution in that way. Um, true, true. It's, it's not a very green solution. Um, so, uh, but at the same time, however, you could also debate how green it is to have an email server running 24-7 waiting for someone to log into the POP true. or SMTP. True. But there might be something in between. Uh, but you're right that there's, there's, a, there's a good question there and uh, the proof of work is a, is a problem. Uh, same with Bitcoin also not being very green in that mm -hmm. sense. And there's a lot of interesting people um, mining bitcoins with huge setups and uh, just uh, slurping power uh, crunching hashes um, and uh, there's a lot of a lot of uh, fans saying there well it's necessary because uh, you know we were protecting uh, anonymity here and it's going to cost something uh, so but weighing costs and benefits uh, i think that's a very uh, wise thing to do here and so yes proof of work is not green as you could say um, it, will, it could get greener in the future. Uh, computers might, may, may, you know, go faster, um, and it might take shorter. But then the proof of work might also have to be adapted, because it would become easier to span the network. So that's definitely still a, a, a weak spot. Um, well, we have also uh, opportunities of widespread adoption. It's not happening yet. At the same time, though, it's being embraced by a lot of people. Also, uh, already non-techies are very interested in BitMessage. So I do think there is definitely an opportunity for widespread adoption. And uh, if, uh, if enough tools can be built to make it work uh, comfortably alongside email, uh, I definitely think it could take off. Um, there's something that's also a strength and perhaps a threat is the anonymity. Uh, and that has to do with the abuse of service. Um, if uh, BitMessage would be used for uh, something evil, and, uh, and news of that would spread, uh, it could cause uh, repercussions also in politics or government or whatever. And, um, and that could be difficult for, uh, for the BitMessage network. Um, you mean if it gets slashed off? You mean uh, no, no, not if it just gets attention, <laughs> but if, if a negative uh, oh. use of BitMessage yeah. uh, gets a lot of attention, uh, for example, planning terrorism attacks. Oh, yeah, yeah. You don't know. So, um, and uh, um, of course, um, people that like to work with decentralized tools, like myself, often want to think that uh, even uh, the change of, of politic, politics or rules will not really affect this message because it's the internet. We can do what we like. Uh, there's also a lot of uh, work being done uh, in deep packet inspection and also in trying to crack uh, cryptography. Uh, that could uh, be a threat to the BitMessage network. So you shouldn't feel safe if you don't know uh, exactly what's going on. It's very difficult to know what's going on in the entire landscape um, of uh, not just cryptography, but also what goes on in the undercurrents. So for example, what the NSA has been doing lately with cryptography is very interesting, and it's very good to, uh, to think about what's, what's happening uh, from a privacy perspective. Um, also a threat and a weakness, I think, is the uh, use of elliptic curve cryptography in, in BitMessage. And why? It's because 
lately there has been a lot of uh, noise about that. Uh, the NIST actually um, temporarily retracted uh, one of their standards because the NSA helped to develop elliptic curve cryptography. Um, what they have also done uh, at that time is, is generate sequences of random numbers and code for that. That doesn't really generate very random numbers, so that makes it easier for, uh, for uh, groups like that to try and uh, crack the code. Now, I don't know how realistic it is that they will do that if they've been able to uh, um, seed bad numbers, as you could say, into this uh, uh, cryptography. Uh, I wonder, uh, do you know that? Well, I don't think that... Well, it depends. Because <laughs> they could try to break it, but if the random key generator is not good enough, they can run all kinds of statistics and it could be the case that they are able to break it indeed. Okay. So but it's, it's uh, statistical analysis uh, is, is one of the entry points there. Yeah. And the whole, the whole point is that in, instead of uh, a billion possibilities to calculate, you uh, suddenly have only 10,000 to calculate. You know? Yeah, a lot less so, work to yeah, do. Yeah. At the same time, um, BitMessage doesn't send audio and video, so the amount of data transferred is much smaller, so then it becomes a bit harder again. Uh, but, well, who's there to say what they can and cannot do? So that's a nice area to research as well. Um, and another uh, weakness at the moment is attachments. Um, many people uh, send attachments and don't even know that they're doing that because HTML is much used in email these days. Uh, so they like to send the pictures of their dog and you know, their house, and et cetera, et cetera. So uh, those things uh, are not supported in BitMessage yet. Um, another possible weakness, but also an opportunity, is the 48-hour destructive cache system. Uh, it makes sure that uh, the garbage in the network is collected, or well collected, dumped into dev null. At the same time, um, it's also uh, a problem because the messages might get lost if somebody sends a message and it doesn't quite um, reach the receiver on time, and the person doesn't attempt to send it again, so he doesn't fire up the client for a long time then the message will be delayed for a long time as well. So there's a, a problem there. So this is a bit of a, a SWOT analysis uh, for, from my perspective. Uh, and this was a, an overview of BitMessage. Um, I wonder if this has raised any other interesting questions. What happens if um, uh, a recipient um, doesn't acknowledge a message uh, and the sender tries to resend it. I mean, that way you can force a, a sort of, well, you can get, you will get uh, collisions over time. I mean, well, uh, it's messages possible. will be resent, and since it's not acknowledged. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, at the moment, advanced users can set uh, certain flags in their public okay. key, or at least in data included in their public key. And, um, that makes it possible to not acknowledge a message. Uh, there are some people that have reason or not to be very paranoid, or just want to be very paranoid. They don't want to send acknowledgements. Uh, BitMessage has support for third-party acknowledgements as well, so they could actually let someone else do the acknowledgement that the message is in the network. Mm. And um, I believe it's also possible uh, that the message is acknowledged that it has arrived, but then it would be done by proxy inside the network itself. But uh, why, why would you do that? Well, um, maybe sending an acknowledgement uh, from, from, from one perspective or another could be a dangerous thing to do. Maybe yeah, somebody just only wants to, to receive uh, messages and not send anything out at all. Yeah, so that way you can avoid that people uh, collecting all the data of the network would see that the acknowledgement came from that node in the network. <coughs> um, Perhaps. I don't know if that's possible. What I do know is that at the same time this can provide plausible deniability in the case of a lawsuit. So if you have never sent acknowledgments mm -hmm. in the case of a lawsuit, you could say, well, that acknowledgement could have been sent by any peer, you know, it doesn't have to be sent by mine. And so uh, it just gives a little bit, it's just, let's say it's just an extra feature to, uh, to the way to how you could receive messages. Most people and most clients, however, are just set to acknowledge and it's also the most efficient way to receive a message at the moment. 
I was wondering, can the proof of work be also used for something positive? For example, there are a lot of uh, tasks, let's say computational tasks uh, out there. For example, the data that the collider produces, it needs to be processed. And can that, that be used uh, to, for, for example, to distribute a task to the machine and when the machine finishes the task, that could be used as a proof of work. Of course, it has to be centralized because you need a server to distribute the tasks, but then you will ex at least extract some uh, meaning out of the processing power that the computers are using in order to generate the messages. Yes, exactly. Well, you're right. At this moment, the proof of work is basically meaningless in the sense of nothing uh, scientific is being achieved there except crunching a hash. Um, uh, but this is being done in, uh, in um, uh, not in Bitcoin, but in Primecoin. I don't know if you know that. Uh, Bit Bitcoin has given rise to many different types of alternative currencies. So in BitMessage, this is not being done. But in all these alternative currencies, there's one called Primecoin, where the proof of work is being used to calculate prime numbers, to calculate them as far as possible. And uh, so there they do uh, attempt to use this proof of work to do something useful. <coughs> and, um, but at the moment, I know of no other initiatives to use the proof of work for something useful. Yeah. How can a computer compute if a message really contains uh, normal text? Because if the output of the encryption is not uh, undistinguishable from random, then it's not good output. True. Uh, I don't exactly know how they've solved it here, but I suspect it's being done by including uh, a certain sequence of numbers, either based on date or something else, that when decrypted is easily recognized. So that's what I suspect, but, but I'm, not, I'm not sure about that. Can't anyone include that in this message? Uh, and that's automatically included in the messages. Uh, but so the spammer can include that as well. Uh, yes, that's true, but he'll still have to do the proof of work to be able to send his message. So spamming would be a very slow process. Take a long the time. has to do the proof of work. Yes. Okay. Yes, unless he can hire someone to do it. But, but it's in any way, it's more costly than just spamming, as you could do with email. Spamming is still possible. It's only less profitable. Yes, it's very. It's, it's much less profitable. Yeah. yeah. So it would take for every message you send four minutes. Yes. Basically. Yes. So if you have so a large how list is that going to be widespread adoption? Because that would probably be. Well, unuseful if you want to do a, a, a regular message uh, conversation with someone. Not email, but like instant messaging. It wouldn't be used for instant messaging, no. So it would be more used as an email replacement. And messages would probably go into some sort of outbox, as they do right now with BitMessage. And there they just sit there and they have a little message saying if they've been received or, or not. They have been sent. But um, from, from the user friendliness point of view, Yes, it could be done a bit better there, and uh, I'm, I'm wondering how, how that's going to be solved in the future, if that's going to be solved, or if the user will always have to wait four minutes before being able to send the email back and forth. Okay. Uh, let's say I want to send a message to 100 people. Do I need to do the proof of work 100 times? If you want to send it to 100 individuals, yes. But you could also tell the 100 indiv individuals to subscribe to your BitMessage address, and then you could send a mass message. But it wouldn't be a private message because anyone who subscribes to the address could then receive it. So that's more for public announcements. But if you want to send it to 100 individuals, you would have to um, do the proof of work for, I think, every one of them. Um, uh, what you could possibly do is send it to someone and say, just pass <coughs> it on, you know. But uh, I, I think that would, that's the way it would, would have to be done. So you don't have private channels? With, with 100 people? Actually, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, if the network becomes larger and more people uh, involved in this uh, big message network, is it going to take more time than four uh, minutes? And uh, you need more calculations to find the recipient? Uh, no, it will, uh, the proof of work is always, on average, computers four minutes. Um, with because the current status of the network. If the network becomes larger, what happens? Yeah, it's not like with Bitcoin that, okay. the that there's more difficult work gets bigger. 
So it's it's uh, it's a, it's the no. It doesn't grow if the network grows. Uh, no, no, no. That's also because uh, the cache is destructive. So um, in theory, older proofs would be reintroduced, and uh, in that way, uh, that would still keep the time at the same length, same duration. Every computer along the way of the stream checks the proof of work. Uh, no. Um, no, the proof of work is, is only done to be able to, to create an acceptable hash. So it's only uh, that the other peers check that hash. They don't have to calculate it themselves. Otherwise, it would become a whole lot of calculation. Yeah. It would, be, it would, it would yeah. congest the network entirely. Exactly. Okay. That's a long shot. That was what I was wondering about. Yeah. Well, that was uh, an overview of BitMessage. So I hope to see some of you uh, sending these messages around in the future. Yeah. <laughs> so I think I think uh, I guess that if people still have questions, they can meet you. Uh, I'll be here for a while. Yeah, I won't be here very long. So that's okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Then uh, I would like to ask uh, Mieke for the next one. Thank you.